welcome welcome once again to the show where we point red lasers around the room to annoy people how's it going everybody you ready to talk about the day walker i am ready sorry i meant the night rider oh he's the night rider he must be in camelot i expect with a nice horse michael nice or should we say michael long yeah <laughs> I tried to make some dodgy AI images this week, and every time for Night Rider, I just keep making a guy on a horse. It wouldn't make anything else. <laughs> yeah, pilot season rules on. Yeah, we're hitting one of my favourites this week, definitely. I know I probably say that every week, but I have a lot of favourites. I, I I know a guy, another state, like who's another um like collector friend who, do, who does hobby customs and figures as well as collecting stuff. He's got a real one of these. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's not, doesn't do all the things Kit does. It doesn't go up stunt jumps, but he's got a, a real life size. One of these one-to-one -one scale. <laughs> it's the best scale. If someone pulled up in one of these and said like, Oh, this is like the real pitch. I'd immediately <laughs> try to, to test that theory, you know, <laughs> so I can hit this baseball bat off your off your hood and yep. it won't even dent it. Yeah, I can fire bullets at your window and you'll be fine. Yeah, it's quite a popular um like the Pontiac Firebird, like the car I mean the car was a cool looking car to start with, but there's a lot of uh fan show, you know, touring and recreation like this one, bloody ectos and batmobiles, like classic, you know, like the old Adam West Batmobile turn up at car shows and people that have private collections and stuff. It's real, real popular. Collectors are one of the car nuts as well as TV, TV show nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, it's a, a really, really cool looking car. No doubt about it. Just awesome. Iconic. Uh, we were just talking before we started recording. Um, I'm probably going to pick up that new Transformers crossover one that's yes. coming out of the, the night 2000 because it does look pretty cool. I haven't oh, been good. on the previous ones, so I, I might I might go for this one. Like I only have the Back to the Future one from made from the Sideswipe mold, and it looks like the same scale as that, and that was really nice. I was really impressed with that, and Ecto was very nice. I don't have it. I might still get it. Some of the other crossovers that I've been mean, dodgy, like that, that Top Gun one, that was that was awful. But, but the Knight Rider one looks really good. Yeah, I can't even... I'm trying to think. Yeah, there was a Jurassic Park one as well, wasn't there? Yeah, that was just a repurpose of the Megatron from the Beast Wars, repainted. But they did a, a kind of remoulded... It was either Hound or Skids. There was like the Jurassic Park Jeep, one of those kind of cobbled together from. But it was it was different enough that that robot was quite decent as well. Actually, no, they did two of those. They did the one with the Jeep and the T Rex, and they did another one that was like a Dilophosaurus, which was like a. Well, I think that was more of an original mold, not so much reuse of other stuff. Well, they were decent folks, but they, you know, they weren't as good as what we're about to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah, so we've, pilot season's come along. We've done over the last month Magnum PI. We've talked about MacGyver, Angus MacGyver, uh, the A team, of course, the real A team. Forget that other guy who's in the pilot. He's out of here. He's not soon seeing him again. <laughs> and getting the old team together. Now we've got Michael Knight coming into the mix. We're going to be going very fast in this episode, up to 125 miles per hour. So please. Uh, if you need some oxygen tanks, seat belt, get all get all the, your kit and caboodle together. But for now, we're going to some normal normal cruise to kick off. My blood pH seven point seven eight. That's not that's not bad. I'm not sure if I could handle the uh, the anxiety of like knowing my like heart rate and blood pressure <laughs> and stuff while driving. <laughs> and your <laughs> Why don't why don't we have this in cars now? They had this in the eighties. We should have this in all, all cars by now. And it's funny the uh, steering here is like a almost like a flight control rather than a car. This looks quite strange. I noticed some stuff now. I'm not going to get into it right now. I'll wait till we get yeah. to the to the moment then where it's yeah. I, I just shoved those close ups in. So I thought otherwise I'll forget. 
right on top put them right at the start just look into these core <laughs> I actually opens with pretty much more or less the the proper intro that you'd expect. Yes. The other it just hits you that music and the cars like in your face. The only thing that's different is in the the show's main intro as it continues. Isn't there like a voiceover that says something about you know he's one man who can make a difference? There's something like that that's. Uh, yeah, the voiceover. It's in it for the rest of the series, but it, it's not in this pilot you. intro. It's like the, the regular ones have that like voiceover, and it's just telling you, like, you know, it's like every episode, someone's first episode, it's telling you in case you've never seen it, what, what it's about. Which is good. Definitely, uh, I benefited from that approach because I, I like, I did eventually see the pilot as a youngster. It just came on on a rerun, but. I didn't actually see the series in chronological order or anything, so yeah, no, no. that type of int introduction with the voiceover was a was a big help for, I, for I don't know. me watching for the first time. In any of these shows we're talking about over the last month, I don't think I ever saw the first episode of these shows until I had the DVD sets in the last two years. <laughs> that included. So, um, picking things off here in Vegas. High rollers at a casino. Um, so we have this like setup where we've got this like big shot business dude. He seems to be on a winning streak at the tables and he's being flanked by a, a large security team. And he's also got a beautiful blonde by his side as well, who's kind of keeping him company and cheering him on as he as he keeps winning. But we see there's in the background there's a little bit of espionage going on so apparently this guy he's head of some corporation that has a lot of um you know sensitive secrets and technologies and information that would be worth quite a lot of money and it appears there's some um you know type of sinister gang essentially trying to rip off these secrets so we see this there's uh plots and you know planning and scheming to try and get this guy to stay at the, the tables and keep winning so this another member of the team can go up to his hotel room and start taking photographs of these plans and, and secret documents that he has up there just kind of lying around uh, willy-nilly in the hotel room as you do so um yes the uh the girl on the team, I believe, or one of the girls on the team, her name is Lonnie. She sneaks into his room and she starts um, taking pictures and, uh, you know, gathering information. And as she's leaving, she's spotted by what appears to be an electrician working in the corridor. But it turns out he's actually a cop, an undercover cop. And he's working with another undercover cop. Uh, Michael Long, who's also on the casino floor watching what's going on. So we're given the impression that while this kind of criminal gang is trying to, to rip off the, the businessman, that there, these two undercover cops are, are on the job and they're trying to stop this from happening. So the cop who's posing as a, an electrician, he um, starts following uh, Lonnie out of the building, but he's spotted by another, um, you know, gang member or team member of, of their crew, and he gets shot in the car park. So Michael Long, he is, you know, completely distraught that his partner has been shot. He goes to pursue um Lonnie and and try and you know arrest her I guess and he's also joined by the beautiful blonde Tanya who we saw earlier on she was keeping the the businessman company so she she's supposedly is part of the security team um that's supposed to be looking out for this guy and she doesn't know what's going on so she hops in the car with Michael and they um they speed off in pursuit of these um these thieves, these spies, these um, whatever you'd like to call it, these corporate espionage thugs that are, are stealing these secrets. So 
they they catch up with them and um there's a little bit of a a confrontation so uh yeah we're seeing this all here actually so yeah we saw the guy he was winning at the tables he was being distracted and and kept where he was supposed to be down on the floor while Lonnie was sneaking in and gathering all the the bits and pieces she needed for the heist but yeah so Michael and Tanya they pursue they catch up with Lonnie and her friends who she's about to hand the the information over to and then there's a there's a confrontation would you say Johnny there's a a showdown and you know Michael Long he uh he pulls his gun and he and he tells them to drop their weapons and hand over the the stolen information but it turns out that Tanya who's accompanied him is actually working with these criminals and she actually pulls a gun on on Michael and you know he tries to reason with her and he's like you know if you turn yourself in you know i can cut you a deal with the feds or whatever which of course she doesn't ex- accept and instead she <laughs> shoots him point blank in the face uh right in front of his car gets shot in front of the bottom of the car and rolls down and the criminals get away and we see this Michael Long has been left for dead beside his car just as this helicopter is hovering over and uh, we see an old man commenting um, that oh my gosh we're too late and it kind of just hovers above um, this this car with, with Michael Long lying alongside so we uh, we cut to this very nice posh mansion estate that's um clearly not really where these guys live in real life or whatever because they totally they land their helicopter in a field they don't even have like a landing pad for a helicopter you know? <laughs> but um yeah so we see that michael long he's still alive and he's been brought to this place and he's been worked on by this guy's private doctor and they're remarking that it's um it's really a miracle that he survived being shot point blank in the head. But what actually happened was that he'd had a steel place in his forehead from like a previous military surgery and the bullet had uh, deflected off that and kind of went out the other side of his face. So even though it really, you know, messed him up big time and like mangled his face, he has survived. So they give him facial reconstructive surgery and nurse him back to health over a a period of weeks and finally we get the reveal um when all the bandages are taken off and the the eye patches removed we see it's uh the handsome david hasselhoff so we're getting a look at the new michael long because i suppose we should have we should have probably mentioned that at the beginning of the show michael long is not actually the Best switch switch survive gun shot wound. Yeah, guarantee yeah. survival tactics. Switch to a different actor, you'll survive. <laughs> so yeah, um I don't know the name of the guy who was playing the original, original Michael Long. It's not really relevant. We'll never we'll never have to worry about him again, even though he probably appears <laughs> in the series <laughs> uh, you know, multiple times as different characters and stuff. I wouldn't be surprised. So yeah, we got to reveal this um the Hoff is now Michael Long and he looks totally different. You know, the doctor, he gives him a mirror and he's looking at himself in the mirror and he doesn't quite have like, you know, the the Joker reaction where he's like laughing and smashing yeah. the mirror or anything <laughs> like that. But he he isn't pleased that his face looks so different because he doesn't recognize himself. And uh, Larry you know, Anderson. Uh, the Larry Anderson, he's the original Good old Michael Larry. Long. But, uh, well, Larry Berry for short. Michael, you know, he's yeah, he's not pleased with this new face, but the the doctor and uh and and this would be benefactor are trying to convince him, hey, look, you know, your old face is gonna get you killed if people realize you're you're still alive, you know, the the criminal organization that, that did this to you, they operate above the law, they could have gotten to you at any time and you know, at the moment 
you're actually legally dead, you know. So apparently these guys, um, this rich dude and his uh, assistant swiped the body from a morgue of like, a, you know, a medical university and left it by the car where, where Michael Knight had been shot. So they, they don't want people to know that he's been rescued and that he's still alive. Everything's been kept. It's a bit mission very, impossible. Much, it's much. like, you know, his face is all different and... What do you think of this whole initial opening and introduction getting us to? I oh, like it. It's cool. it's, it feels like a mix of like James Bond, Casino Royale, Mission Possible, Ocean's Eleven sort of thing. It's got the bit of style and glam, and the lady who shoots him in the face feels like one of those Bond villains, just like real good looking, real stylish, wealthy, but just like a complete, you know, bastard character just going to shoot you right in the face. We at least expect it. But I, I like the cast. I like the setup, and there's a bit of uh, mystery and intrigue. There's a bit of a mysterious man, as far as we went. We know we don't really know all the background, but we're going to find out as we go along. Yes, the the blonde lady Tanya Walker, Phyllis Davis is the name of the actress who who plays her. A beautiful woman, and yes, very uh, very femme fatale. You know, she really has no yeah. mercy gunning him there's down at the beginning of the show just stepped out of the salon <laughs> yeah glowing in in the moonlight you know so um we see uh as the the weeks roll on michael is recovering we see him jogging around the estate and getting fitter and healthier and one night he notices that there's like i guess a mix of kind of workers and scientists so he's kind of noticed going in and out of this building that's attached to the estate at all hours of the night so you know he was previously a cop so he's naturally curious he he sneaks in one night and he walks into like a dark warehouse and all of a sudden he's lit up by the beams of the headlights of a car that drives towards him very fast before hitting the brakes and the lights come on and basically it's old Mr. Nice and I must actually get this guy's name right because I Mr. always nice forget his name. Um Devin um Devin Miles is the name of the character. So he's gonna be like, you know, Michael's helper throughout the, the series and the, the Nice Industries representative. Yeah. But old Mr. Nice and, and Devin, you know, they're like well, you know, this is what we're doing here. This is what we're making. And Michael Knight's like, or sorry, Michael Long, I should still say at this point, is <laughs> you know, I, I don't get it. I don't understand what you're building a car in the middle of the night. Why is everything so top secret and hush hush? <laughs> and, you know, old Mr. Knight. Oh, I just feel like, like a James well, Bond movie. Is something going to explode when I turn around? Have you got a pin laser? <laughs> You would be thinking that it's like, what are these guys doing? You know, because um, yeah, you're you're seeing these guys in like hazmat suits and stuff coming and going from the building too. It's like, what are what are they building? Is this here, a secret you know? volcano base? <laughs> but uh, Devin Miles um, explains to Michael that it's a it's a very special car. It's not the same car that he drove at the beginning of the show. It's just not his regular Trans Am, even though it may look like it from a distance. Uh, this is a, a very special car indeed. So. Michael, he walks up to the car, he's like inspecting it, and he's like, oh, well, look, you, you did a great job with the paint, and there's not a scuff on it, and it, it looks beautiful, but as he's kind of touching the hood and, and rubbing his hand along as he notes that the the feel of it is very soft, he, he remarks that it almost feels like, uh, you know, baby skin, which, you know, is a weird uh, a weird thing to definitely feel when you're, when you're rubbing the surface of a car. And, uh, you know, Devin, he uh, he pulls out a lump hammer and he's like, you know, hit it with this. <laughs> and Michael's like, what, hit my car with a hammer? Like, are you crazy? You've, you've just fixed it up for me. And he's like, no, no, it's it's fine. Just hit it. And um, he won't do it. So Devin hits, it, hits the car himself. He strikes it as hard as he can and doesn't even put a dent in it, doesn't even leave a mark on it. So we... He hits he hits the hammer off the car and it just does no damage at all, which of course amazes Michael and amazes us, the viewer watching at home. And Devin, he's like, "Come on, get in. We're going to take this car on a test drive." So a pair of them get into the car, and straight away we see that this car 
it's like you know as michael describes it it looks like darth vader's bathroom there's just buttons everywhere there's consoles there's computer screens oh wow look at that look at that the jada knight rider yeah that's the big one beautiful there's a button in there somewhere i don't know how to press it <laughs> it does light up try me i think i've got to move the door oh there we go there he's going oh, that's cool awesome that is awesome very very cool so yeah like as as Michael had remarked, it's it's looking a lot like Darth Vader's bathroom, the interior of this car. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have what you describe as a normal steering wheel. It looks almost like a steering joy pad or, or, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But, it, yeah, lots of fancy schmancy electronics and consoles and screens. And, you know, Devin, he tries to start explaining the intricacies of the car to Michael. But Michael's like, look, I don't need you to to tell me how to how to drive i know how to drive puts his foot down on the accelerator and the, the car immediately <laughs> crashes through the wall uh of the lab so um yeah smashes the car through the wall and that's another thing as well because prior to getting in um devon had explained to him that you know that the the car is designed in such a way that you know the onboard you know computer can prevent you from from ever crashing or having a collision unless you wish it to do so so when michael drives through the wall straight away he's like you know what the hell you said it it, it couldn't collide with anything he's like oh yeah but you have to activate the system first so he then he actually <laughs> switches on the system so um the system is initialized and they go for a little spin so straight away he starts um really pushing it to the limit speeding along the road and he's catching up on this big rig truck he's coming up behind him and then all of a sudden the car takes control of itself and it um whips him around the truck and like overtakes the truck at high speeds and then like kind of pulls them in along the road and michael's like what what the hey you know the car just took over by itself what's going on it's one of them google cars explodes. that's going to drive into a lake next <laughs> uh, yeah it's one of those um Hassler cars is that one of those ones yeah, that's um, the ones but uh, yeah, Davin explains to him that the uh, the car took over um, the situation, you know, because it thought that Michael was driving erratically and it decided that it could either slow down or it could overtake the truck. So Michael's like, well, why did it overtake the truck? That doesn't seem like a very safe thing to do. And Davin's <laughs> like, oh, no, the You haven't the seen my driving on the country yeah. roads here, have you? <laughs> so and, uh, all you do is overtake the trucks all day. <laughs> The, the reason for this, Devin says, is because the car was showing off. So you know, <laughs> yeah. we're getting a we're getting a little indication here that the the car is intelligent. You know, it's it's more it's than meets the eye. It was good say. intelligence. What do you think of the this intro to the actual car? Um, seeing oh, it's, it's, it's awesome because we get time. to find out the um car is a car then you know we get to find out the kits the car we're about to find out it's got an ai and it's a, a character as well as being a car and we won't see in the pilot but on the small scale i do have a to have a car over here oh that's a nice red echo it becomes the villain later on in the later season episodes but yeah no it's a really cool uh introduction and they do you know show off what a kick ass stylish vehicle like real world vehicle it is with some minor modifications and like the kind of body and height and all that for for the show as well as usual mock-ups for you know having extra doubles and whatnot it says they had uh some of the interior stuff so all the fancy dash they had some like a sound stage kind of duplicate for close-ups of that and other ones were like more for actually driving and whatnot and but yeah so awesome introduction i, lo I love seeing all these um sexy close-ups on the panels and the miles per hour and, and all of them are just like feels like kind of retro futuristic all the design of those panels and stuff just looks so cool and it's very bond where it's got all it we, we don't know yet but it's going to have a heap of features and cool gadgets just like it's like all the best features of all your bond fancy mobiles rolled into one <laughs> and it's got an onboard uh voice ai thing as we're going to find out so uh, yeah dave um they take their little test drive and 
to get back to the mansion. And unfortunately, um, since they've been gone, old Mr. Nice has taken quite mm. ill. So he calls Devin and Michael to his bedside for his final moments. And he pleads with mm. Michael Long to essentially take on a cause, with the cause being that he would get revenge on the organization and the you know these kind of shadow type shadowy type organizations that are committing these espionage crimes that you know that seem to be above the law he would have the full backing and funding of night nice industries to, to take on this cause he'd also obviously of course have access to the car most importantly and um you know michael initially he's like look I'm not I'm not the right guy to do this. You know, I, I wake up every night. I still have nightmares about being shot in the face. You know, I I, I can't take on this type of responsibility. I just want I just want to get, you know, my life back. And you know, oh Mr. Nice, he's like, Oh, you know, no, you have to channel these feelings and you know, this is your baptism by fire and you know, I need you um take this on because, you know, one man can make a difference, you know, which will become a a staple statement of the show. So And something else important oh, Mr. Nice. Here too, is we, he's going from yeah. his um old civvy civilian clothes to his kind of kind of almost superhero y outfit. He's got his red shirt and his leather jacket, you know. He's like we got this like yes. iconic outfit that makes him like a bit more extraordinary person sort of thing. But yeah, poor old, poor old Mr. Nice uh, passes away. And after this, uh, Michael decides, actually, you know what? I am going to, I am going to take up his offer and I'm going to go after these guys. So he informs um, Devin he's heading out to, you know, wherever it was that the their last bit of intelligence had that the gang was, was operating. And Devin's like, well, look, you can't just, you can't just leave now and, and go after them. You know, there's so much stuff about the car that I haven't explained to you. And, you know, Michael's like, look, I'm going and look, it's my car. Anyway, it's in my name. And then Devin's like, well, actually it's not in your name. It's in the name of Michael Knight, <laughs> which is your new name and your new identity. Yeah, and he gives, him a, he gives him a driving license and a credit card and other identification that's in the name of Michael Knight. So, you know, Michael Long, like we mentioned earlier, he is officially deceased. So now yeah. it is new Michael face, Knight you know. who you face new name and he's you know, he's carrying on the work of Mr. Knight Senior and he's representing and he's backed by Knight Industries. But nevertheless, even though Devin um hands him over all this stuff, he still is rushing out the door and won't listen to him explain anything about the car. So he um he sets off and he's driving along and he's kind of just talking to himself as he's driving and he's, he's looking around the car and he kind of says, you know, well, you'd think with all this fancy equipment, they'd at least install a radio. And next thing, this voice um, says back to him, well, what would you like to listen to? And this totally freaks him out. <laughs> he, uh, he pulls in the car. He thinks that there's somebody listening in on like a, a two-way radio or, or speaking to him. But it, no, it's the car itself that's talking to him. It's it's Kit. It's the night 2000. And um, yeah, like Johnny said, it's its own AI. It's its own personality. And he can talk and have a back and forth. So this is our first introduction to um, to Kit, the, the character. So... We get a little bit of snarky back and forth between Kish and Michael. Michael's not overly fussed about the fact that he has a car that can actually talk back to him. It doesn't really sit too well with him. But, you know, Kit, you know, he he gives as good as he can take. And they have a little bit of a bickering session before Michael eventually tells him to basically shut up and let him drive in peace and, and, and not talk to him. So they take off uh, down the road with... Michael, um, you know, cruising along, and while they're cruising along, as you do, Michael just, you know, falls asleep at the wheel uh, while driving, and um, this is not a problem, of course, because Kiss is in control, <laughs> and um, he can pilot the car safely. The only issue is they drive past two cops who see 
what appears to be a guy asleep with his head against the window <laughs> going towards like a, you know, a dead man's bend, a dangerous curve, essentially. So the cops are, uh, they take pursuit and they're like trying to shout him down. They're flashing the lights at him. They're blaring the siren, but the car doesn't pull over because it's uh kiss. He's trying to wake Michael up to see what he wants to do, but Michael won't wake up. So eventually, um, Michael wakes up, sees that the cops are in pursuit, asks Kit to pull in, and before the cops get close to the car, you know, Kiss advises Michael that he'd fallen asleep and he'd had his head um, against the window, so he advises him to pretend that he's deaf and to step out of the car with a kink in his neck as, as to explain why he's leaning his head against the window. And to be fair, it's a brilliant plan. It works out perfectly. He gets out of the car and the cops are like, you know what the hell? You didn't stop when we we tried to to flag you down. And he's like, "Can you talk into this ear? I can't hear what you're saying." And the cops like, "Oh man, he's deaf. That explains everything." <laughs> even though it doesn't really, I don't know if it could explain it completely. Shouldn't but be the, asleep the, while you're driving, so. <laughs> The cops, um, the cops take it at face value that deaf people just drive around like leaning their head against the yeah. you know the car window and don't look in their rear view mirrors either when they're trying to like. You know, <laughs> Flash them and say, Don't steer when they go around big bins. <laughs> but you know, he um, he convinces Might the have done cops. My dad's trick steer with your knees. <laughs> if you're a tall fella, steer with your knees. They believe he's just a kind of a, a deaf, dumb guy, and they leave him to go about his way driving his expensive sports car. You know, it's it's a good enough explanation for them. And uh, Michael also remarks this because uh, he's on the outskirts of this town he's been going to when he gets pulled over and he remarks that this probably isn't going to be the first time I get in trouble in this town. So uh, he pulls up outside the Palmtron Corporation. What a great name. Great what a brilliant too. name. For beautiful font. Yeah. Anything with Tron really from the company. 80s, you have to like yes. it. Yes. Not Pompitron, just Pompitron. So Michael, yeah, he's um he's sniffing around this company because their intelligence reckons this is where the where the criminal gang are currently operating around trying to steal secrets from this company. So he goes into a local bar and he's kind of watching people come in and out. And he notices this the girl Lonnie from the beginning of the of the episode, who is uh, one of the members. I keep on saying gang. Gang is probably a, a poor word to describe them. Group, you know, part of this criminal group who are who are stealing secrets. We see that she's a bunch um, of bastards. Oh, cool. Yeah, just a bunch bunch of fuckers. Um, but we see her. She's in the bar, and uh, Michael Knight. He spots her from across the bar, and he's drinking and he's watching her. He recognizes her obviously as as one of these criminals from his past, and um. He calls over the waitress, and uh, before I uh, I get into the what happens next, the the lady in this Johnny did she look familiar yeah. to you in any way? This main um, female character who's going to I didn't, I didn't recognize her. What, what has she been? We only um, we only spoke about her literally a couple of weeks ago. So oh, she was in one another show. He was in one of the other shows. So she's a pilot. She's a veteran of the pilots. Her So her name, she's playing the girl Maggie in this, but her name is Pamela Susan Shoup. And she was also in the Magnum PI pilot episode. Wow. She was I was going to say it was the Magnum, of, there's always a lot of nice yeah. looking ladies in Magnum. <laughs> yeah. She was, the, um, she was the sister of Magnum's friend who'd been murdered. Right. She was the the lady who was kind of you know the quasi love interest for makes sense because this, this pilot was like around eight, 1982 and Magnum was very early early eighties as well when it kicked off. I just thought it was pretty cool that she's in um, pilots for two shows that like yeah. did really well, and uh, she's a good actress too. I have to say, like uh, I was happy to kind of see her back in this again. So Michael Nice he asks her, you know. Can you tell me about that girl, um, 
Lonnie over there, which causes Maggie to um, throw a drink on him and, and call him a dead beast, essentially, because she says that anybody who hangs around with her and who works for Computron is like a scumbag, basically. So um, this really pisses off the manager of the bar who fires her, you know, on the spot, <laughs> even though Michael Knight tries to smooth things over and say it was an accident. Apparently this isn't the first time she's lashed out at customers. So <laughs> it's just a standard like, thing throwing drinks on people away. Yeah. So she gets like, tough. sorry, sorry, Maggie, you're fired. You're gone. So she leaves in a huff as anybody would in that situation. And um, as Michael is walking out, he's followed out by the, the lady Lonnie, who said that she heard he, he was asking for her in there. And he's like, Oh yeah. Um, I think you're like friends with Tanya Manning and uh, she's an old friend of mine. I was just wondering if you could tell her I was in town and I've got something to sell to her. So Lonnie kind of has this weird look on her face, like she's kind of suspicious of this whole explanation, but she says that she'll let her know. So we see here some excellent, excellent phone acting. Um, uh, Tanya, she's on the phone. Yes. She's been informed that um this guy has come to town and he's asking questions about her and she's not too happy about it. And we see she's talking to one of the other group members from earlier in the episode who had actually shot Michael Long's partner. And he informs her not to worry if any cops come sniffing around, we'll just deal with them the same way we dealt with all the other cops. So this, um, this group obviously have a habit of just like whacking people once they get close to, to sniffing them out or, you know, exposing them for their crimes and as tanya hangs up the phone we see that she's actually uh in a relationship with the boss of comtron so she's actually um dun, dun, dun. She's, she she's really um going to great lengths as a spy to try and get um you know secret information um to to steal so She's, she's kind of smoozing with the boss man and pretending to be really looking out for his interests. And she's like, oh, darling, you're so lucky that you've got someone like me looking out for you, you know, <laughs> totally evil bitch. While giving him a hug and looking into the camera menacingly, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, she plays the part perfectly. Like, look at that. Oh, she's class. And the corner of that shot of the eyes, like the shifty eyes. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I love it. I love it. It's like and something yeah, you watch on the daytime soaps, you know beautiful woman as well um yeah so yeah we see this um maggie she's on her way home and uh michael nice kind of pulls up alongside her just as she's about to get into her life-size g1 bumblebee and yes. uh drive off yeah. and uh michael he kind of um he moves his car behind her and she's like look you better move your car i'm going to crash into you which she does anyway she she bounces her car off it which of course um when she hits her car off of kiss it just like breaks her own um back bumper and fucks up her car which she's not too happy about but michael the gentleman he agrees to pay for it and give her a lift home and as she's in the car he explains this he's actually not like a friend of comtron or a friend of that girl Lonnie or tanya or any of those people he's really someone who's trying to um basically get justice uh, for something that's happened in the past. And Maggie explains to him that the reason that she reacted the way she did was because that group of people actually had her husband killed. Her husband used to be the head of security in Comtron, but he was whacked by this group. And then obviously they replaced him with their own security people that they've been using to get closer to the boss and, and steal the secrets from the company. and. Uh, you know, so this has left Maggie in this desperate situation where she's like, you know, her husband's been killed. She was working in the bar until that day. Now she's been fired. And she's also got a kid at home who Michael is introduced to um, when he when he helps her back to her 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 place. And um, we also see this funny moment where like the, the babysitter who's like this old Mexican lady is like, oh, he's a real winner. I hope you hold on to this one, you know really putting Michael over as a stud, the hawk yeah. just, you know, found standing one of those in the doorway. Secret agent guys. <laughs> there's so many, even just looking at these uh, screenshots, there's so many um, shots of just Michael Knight standing like this. Yeah, like, he's you got know, broad standing, chest, always he's got the arms back, 
I was always like the, the pick, pick the rules and <laughs> but he's heroic yeah, figure quite, but a stand heroically like a statue yeah quite quite Great a statue. specimen of a man yeah and um you can't, you can't fake that here man that's 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 the ladies love that here we actually saw as well earlier i forgot to mention this when the when the night 2000 was parked outside the bar it had been scoped out by a couple of kind of dodgy looking criminals who were almost yeah, going to rob us but then they, uh, they decide against robbing it just there and then because it's in too much of a public spot but we we see that they've earmarked that car for a later grand theft auto <laughs> yeah here we see them sneaking around and and scoping it out and That's it's uh quality, it's pretty funny quality phone acting i love it yeah great phone i see how he casually just has the arm over the you know that's, <laughs> that, that's you know perfect so yeah while he's on the phone to devon the um the two crooks are trying to break into the car um so first they try picking the lock but it breaks the lock pick then the guy um just tries booting the door in but he just bounces off the door and like cracks his head on the side of the the road <laughs> essentially so his partner has to like drag him off out of there it's uh yeah these two guys are actually pretty entertaining we're going to see them again um you know a couple of times in the episode and they're bright they're driving a pretty nice car themselves like i know nothing about cars but their car looks pretty decent <laughs> it does. they're driving i know so so yeah it was a Maggie had explained to Michael the night before that the uh, Comtron is going to be sponsoring a demolition derby, and uh, wacky races. I call it. <laughs> yeah. So the the thing about this demolition derby supposedly is this: um, you can't just enter any old busted up jalopy in it. You actually have to enter like a new car that's in good condition. Um, that's the stupid that's idea. The kind of, yeah. <laughs> It's it's so the way Maggie explains it, it's mostly just for rich people to show off and like yeah. a lot of the cars that this are in the race. Ironic, are actually, real yeah. demolition derbies usually poor people will take you a beater up car on the weekend where you go out and just smash into each other and everyone hoots and holes. Turns out anyway, this um as you would expect, most people can't afford to um just buy new cars to have them smashed up. No. So <laughs> a lot of the cars that are actually in the race are sponsored by Comtron. They're like company cars. The only um the only independent driver in the race who enters himself that morning is Michael Nice, you know. So he no pulls way. up with, what are the with, chances? He pulls up with Maggie and the kid and he approaches Tanya, who's just there with a clipboard taking signups because you know it's totally normal one minute to be like you know the boss's wife or girlfriend or whatever and next thing you're just the girl who's taking people's names signing up for the demolition derby but anyway <laughs> um he he approaches her and she's like oh you're the man who's been asking around town about me and he's like yes i'm that man i've got something to sell you and she's like well i don't talk to sales people and i'm not interested in buying anything and Michael informs her that after the race, she will be interested in buying something. So to keep a close eye on him and watch him in the in the demolition derby, he also smoozes a bit with the Comtron boss man and kind of puts the ick on Tanya a bit that he's getting a little bit too familiar with him um, already. So um, Michael, he's entered in the race and... Uh, you know, he approaches Maggie just before the race is about to start, and she's like, oh, you know, I can't find my kid anywhere. And Michael's like, oh, don't worry, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. Which, you know, Where ladies, you if you're watching, ladies, that's a bit of a red flag there. If, if you're just starting to see a guy <laughs> or, you know, hang around with a guy and you go out, um, you know, whatever, even that might not be a date, you just go on a day out and your kid disappears and you can't find him. If you turn to that guy and said, I don't know where little Johnny is. And that guy turns around and goes, Oh, don't worry, I'm sure he's around somewhere. And then makes a weapon and actually try and trash and kidnap. Yeah. Not gonna try and help you find him or anything, but look, I'm sure he's yeah. around. I gotta go race. That's a red flag, girls. I'm just saying, you know, he's for probably sure. not the type of guy. I've been in, 
public situations and things like this and my immediate thing is like well stop fucking looking everyone look now scramble <laughs> it's like don't waste a second could get run over or walk off or fall in a ditch or anything also we're, we are like right beside a demolition derby track with like cars whizzing yeah. by at like high speeds and stuff it's uh yeah be not ironically i went to a lot of um, races as a kid with my dad and probably half the time i was just wandering around doing what the fuck you ever <laughs> the race track and don't worry, folks. I'm just, I'm just joking. You know, I'm not yeah. trying to say like be helicopter parents or shit. I was just yeah. making a joke. It was just a, a silly, silly joke. You know. So anyway, Michael, he, uh, he hops in the car and he goes to to drive into the the derby track. And just as he's um about to drive onto the track, the wee kid actually hops up because he's been hiding in the back seat uh the whole time. And. Uh, He's like, oh, you know, his name's Buddy, by the way. I'm just after looking him up there because I keep calling him the kid and that's not fair. <laughs> the character's got a name, God damn it, and his name is Buddy. So um, Buddy, he hops into the into the passenger seat and puts on his seatbelt as Michael gives out to him about, you know, trying to, to stow away in the car. And uh, so they, per they start participating in this demolition derby and it's a pretty cool... Um, sequence of events where you just get to see the type of stuff that kit can do and you know what can happen when you actually activate some of the gadgets and press a few buttons on this car which ironically or you know funnily enough it's not michael that really presses any of the buttons it's little buddy that who decides to, to try and see what the car like can do um, so like like futurama or turtles of michelangelo's just like just press all the buttons and see what happens this way the kid's gonna do and they're very pressable buttons as well. Big chunky yeah. squares with lights on them. If, if I had those buttons button. in here, man, I could not stop pressing. Them. <laughs> so the first button I think he presses is the one to do an oil slick from the back of the car, which yes, causes a um, James Bond a load right of the, um, the other racers to, to crash. And then I think another one of the buttons does like a, a smoke screen type of fog distraction thing, which also you know, causes causes another accident. So basically, with all these gadgets and also the fact that Kit cannot be damaged or Night 2000 cannot be damaged in any way, he's just mincing through the competition in this destruction derby. Yeah, it's and, like um, the <laughs> Yeah. And uh, two of the drivers, two of the Comtron drivers try to, to gang up on him and cut him off, but he just ends up like tearing through them easily as well. So in the end, he's the he's the last racer driving. So he wins the the race and he wins the the trophy. He wins five grand reward, which he says he's going to give to charity because he's just a good guy. And um, Maggie, of course, this whole time was cheering from the sidelines. So I'm assuming she knows her kid is in the car. I hope she does. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, she just stopped looking for her kid to watch a race. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So good parenting. Yeah, good parenting. Oh, look, she's gone through a rough time, you know. And we get some so, um, good, good practical, um, real world stunt driving where the car goes up and teal to two wheels. It was a very popular thing. A lot of action movies and stuff in the 80s. You see a lot of cool, cool stunts. The old ramps and the two yeah. wheels are classics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, we, it was. You know, the guys remarked like this. Oh, it's it's new cars only or whatever, but none of these cars look remotely fucking they all look like to me they look, look like the cars you steal and when you're playing by city when you just got to get yeah. to the outside of town then you dump it and get a good car like the the only independent car in the race happens to be the best car in the race like if yeah. you're talking about a brand new looks like car, it could you know? race. <laughs> yeah all the other ones are well, like anyways, boxy so... as hell that wouldn't really turn around a corner to save their life the race announcer remarks that it is a miracle that the car has come out unscathed from a destruction <laughs> derby, and it must be like you know the first time that's ever happened. Which, yeah, that would raise a few eyebrows, definitely. But we see this um, Tanya; she is now intrigued, and she does believe that the car is some type of military prototype, so she wants to get her hands on it. So she's kind of considering you know, taking the bait if he was to sell a tour, but her um her co conspirator is questioning, you know, whether this guy can be trusted and who exactly is he. So 
he had asked Tanya to um to meet him later at uh, at a local establishment, but uh, Tanya is advised instead not to go and to send a couple of thugs instead, so they can um, rough him up and maybe get his fingerprints, and uh, they can do a background check on him because so far all the background checks they've run him on him have come up zilch because it's like he's only existed a few months his credit card's only a few months old and his driver's license only a few months old it's almost like this man did not exist before a few months yes. ago like a so they're a little bit suspicious of what's going on so uh in the aftermath here we see michael he's Crossing dropping back. maggie home and there's an almost spark of romance between the two, but then Maggie kind of reminds him, look, I've just recently lost my husband and I don't think I'm ready to let another man into my life. And Michael's like, that's okay, because he's a good guy and he's not like going to force any deal on her or anything. So he drops her home and he goes to, to make a phone call to Devin. But in his haste to make the phone call, he leaves his car door open. And uh, just as our two um, crook from earlier on are guiding the area, and they can't believe their luck that the, the Trans Am they were trying to nick from earlier on is there with the door open. So they hop out of their car and they jump in. Michael sees what's happening. He does some great phone acting where he has to drop the phone in a hurry and then run away from the phone box. It's fantastic. It should have been in slow motion. But, um, he can't catch up with the crooks, obviously, because they're in his car and they're like flying up the road. And we cut to the interior of the car where the the two guys are just delighted with themselves that they've been able to rip off this hot set of wheels. And all of a sudden we hear the voice of Kit telling them that they better pull over or there's going to be trouble. And the two robbers kind of speculate, oh, look, it must just be some like fancy smancy alarm system on a tape recorder. But then, you know, obviously Kit starts interacting with them more and warning them that they really better pull over or, you know, something bad might happen. But of course, they don't listen to him. They refuse to comply. So Kit takes over control and proceeds to drive them very dangerously um, <laughs> through the highways and byways until he gets them right outside the cop station and forcefully ejects them both from the driver oh, and passenger it. seat right onto the onto the hood of a cop car with two cops and like like fairly uh fucks up the guys like one of them smashes through the window of the cop car you know yeah of course the oh, of course the cops arrest like the hulk tv show for a minute like the hulk's got and throw them on that cop car the ejector seat always seemed like the most fun if you could just uh, get it right for using it, you know, as a as a tool for convenience, you know. Yeah. I could eject myself up onto the roof to clean the gutters and stuff. <laughs> so yeah, that puts a uh, that puts a uh, an end to our our two crooks trying to rip off the car. Uh, and it cuts to, if you're watching this on TV, it would cut through to a commercial break. We can actually see in one of the stills um, here, it shows like a little circle with the car in it and a little a little square when they're about to go to their commercial break spot. But Yeah, you get those scene transitions are still on the DVD sometimes where it goes black or is a little bit in between. So Kiss, yeah, he disposes of the criminals and he um, he drives back to Michael. Now, I mentioned at the start of this when we started recording that there was a couple of things I noticed watching this on my big screen that I probably didn't notice when I was a kid watching the show at the time. And that is, you can actually sometimes see a pair of gloved hands driving Kiss when nobody's supposed to be driving him. And, and like, it's something that I probably would never have seen on my small TV back in the day. But, um, the gloves, they're like the same type of beige color as the interior of the car. So it's obviously done in such a way where most of the time they'd blend in and you wouldn't actually see them. But uh, I did notice in, um, in a couple of uh, a couple of scenes from, from this moment onwards where you could just see the top of two little hands driving when there's supposed to be nobody. Must be some like guy on the floor or like some robot hands driving or something, you know. But It's just I a little it was man. A little man sitting <laughs> on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, fun times. 
so Michael and Kit are reunited and they are brought, um, or Michael um, is driven to the Rising Sun where he'd agreed to meet Tanya. But when he gets there, Tanya is not there. And instead we get the Comtron thugs who, a few of them are actually drivers from the race earlier as well. So they're pretty pissed off that uh, Michael Knight won the prize money. Cause they yeah, were yeah some outsider won our money. Yeah. Um, the kind of lead driver as well, he is in so much stuff. Like he's in, like, I'm just going to look up his name real quick here because he's just in all sorts of movies, TV. Let me see now. Damn, boy. Okay. Yeah, I love when you get like fun character actors that turn up on different things. Like the dude that plays um, in Seinfeld, that plays the other Kramer in the pilot. Where they're making like the fictional Seinfeld within Seinfeld, but the guy that plays the other Kramer, he's in so many eighties things. He pops with heaps of the shows and movies. Um, I'm most, I'm looking at the list of names because it doesn't show pictures. I have no idea yeah, which one that. is this, but look, that's the worst thing about modern internet is it doesn't match up pictures with names. Like sometimes I've had to go and make my own when I make a slide or a thing, pull things out and match them together because you get a picture of how someone looks now, not how they looked in the eighties, so you don't recognize them. Like, uh, yeah, these guys have definitely showed up in a few things. Like, I'm sure, pretty sure one of them's even like in Porky's. Like, they're they're really familiar. Um, but anyway, uh, they're going to rough up Michael Knight. And Michael Knight, you know, um, gentleman warrior that he is, he's like, look, guys, I just got to tell you, I do know karate. And they all just start <laughs> laughing at him. And then one by one, he, he takes them out. He makes short work of them. And he... And, and you don't see him actually do door. anything. You just see the guys flying in the other direction where he doesn't actually do anything at all. It's just the camera like point of view. Of course, though, this gets him arrested by the local police who are also in the pocket of Comtron. It pretty much turns out this entire town, more or less, is yeah, like, it's like owned an, by the company. Um, episode of the full guy or Bionic Woman or this sort of show. There's always like the town where all the police and everybody are in the pocket of some rich company or person. So uh, Michael Knight and the, the thugs get arrested and Hiss is towed off, but he's not towed to the local impound. He's towed to the Comtron headquarters to be uh -huh. examined and, you know, looked over to see if they can find any interesting secrets that he might hold. So for about the, uh, the fourth or fifth time now in this episode, we get some more great phone acting. This time, Michael yes, Knight is making his... Jailhouse phone acting now. That's yeah, fantastic. he's making his... His phone call, he's in jail, he gets his one phone call. We also he's, get a uh, telegram on the scene, so that's you're not gonna see any of those in modern yeah. stuff. Soon to be replaced by fax, and then you know. And then but, uh, wrong fax before we get to better fax. But yeah, Michael he's pleading with Devin to try and get somebody down there to to spring him and you know, he says he doesn't know where Kit is and Devin, he's not overly pleased, but he more or less hangs up on them and tells them they're going to have to resort to desperate measures. So, Michael, he's kind of left hanging and he's brought back to his his cell. And as he's kind of passing time and laying about in the cell, um, we cut back to the Comtron labs and we see that they're having awful difficulty trying to get Kiss opened up. They're trying to drill through. The drill keeps breaking. They're trying to like break the doors off. They can't get in. So yeah, there we're getting more demonstration of this kind of industry. I, I like the exterior uh, to the production car. value. We get all these panels and tools and such, but also in the background, seeing filling empty cardboard boxes. No, no expense spared <laughs> there. Yeah, and we're going to see a few more of them, not only in this episode, but throughout the entire series, anytime there's a, a truck uh, carrying something. I like to imagine that there's vintage toys in there because it's 1982. I anything could be inside those boxes. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, because um, yes, on the telegram that they received from the background check they did on Michael Knight, it turns out that his fingerprints have been altered, so he can't be identified that way either. So this is really throwing them for a loop. But how do they know they've been altered? <laughs> that's what I want to... That's that's yeah, that's so weird. But it says <laughs> it on the telegram. Great. Can't argue with what it says in the telegram. If yes. the telegram says they've been altered, they've been altered. But um, we cut back to the 
jail cell. And we see that the the lead racer thug is kind of warming up a bit to Michael Knight and he's kind of asking him questions and asking him about his car and he's giving him a bit of background about how he, he was hired to work for Comtron. He says he's pretty much an ex-con and that Comtron kind of hired him to kind of keep the locals in line and make sure nobody comes sniffing about the company and asking the wrong <laughs> type of questions. So he's pretty honest with him here in the jail cell. It's really, it's really um, a legit company I'm working for. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And then, of course, we cut back to Tanya and her partner arguing about what exactly is going on with this Michael Knight character and what is the deal with the car because they can't even get in and in to the car in such a way that they can even look at a serial number or look at a chassis or anything. Like the car is totally impenetrable, and uh, you know they're getting they're beginning to get worried that this Michael Knight might be part of an organization that's operating outside the law. So they. Up until now, they've been planning on pretty much ripping off all the plans from Comtron, but now they're, they've are they decided to move their plans along and they're only going to go for the main computer plans that are worth the most money because their plan is, um, I keep on saying plan, but their idea is to get the information and get the hell out of there tonight um, because they're worried that the, the net's beginning to close in on them. So we cut back to jail. Michael, he's having his chat with his new thug buddy who's telling him, you know, maybe you should make another phone call because whoever you called on your last one doesn't seem to be showing up. And uh, just as we're having this chat, we see that Kiss has reactivated himself in the Comtron warehouse. He busts himself out the door, drives all the way through the local jail and uh, busts his way into the jail as well. Busts right through the jail wall. and. uh, gets Michael out of there. And it's good timing as well. The, the he, other he, guy nearly gets killed as he busts through the wall. He's right yeah. next to it. <laughs> the timing, of course, is perfect because um, part of the, or, or a couple of the criminals had already been on their way to the jail to whack uh, Michael Nice in jail. So Kiss just arrives at the right time to, to get him yeah. out of there. It reminds but me of those old John Wayne movies where like, you know, he's the good guy and the bad guys are coming to kill him and then his buddies are going to break him out. Is it like now it's kits of cars instead of horses, of course. But it's a very, very familiar scene. They'll bust, Jay will bust out. And it's uh, we're coming down now to the to the closing acts because... I tell you what, I'd buy a die cast for that police car that says Comtron on the side of it. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. Now, Comtron's just a great name. Yeah. put it on the list of it might trans- that could be another transformer it's, it's like, like like that car you could have that car transform into like an evil another evil bad car <laughs> not car car but another bad robot <laughs> omtron were uh bought out by ocp in 1994 yes. so um yeah, we're, we're coming up to the crunch time. So Michael and Kit are on their way back to comtron headquarters to to head off to crooks and um, this is where we get to see how the eject function can be used for for your own um, convenience when Michael pulls up alongside the building and um, Kiss advises him on how to use the eject function to spring himself up out of the car and over the, the lip of the roof so he's able to get in through the roof, which is very, very cool. Looks like it would be incredibly fun and also terrifying at the same time if it was a real yes. thing. As long as, long as the roof is not on fire, it's a good, good strategy to go in there. So um, Michael, he sneaks into the building. We also see that one of the security guard notices that the car is back in around the building. So he, they radio that in. And we see Tanya, she's sneaking around upstairs. She has the access codes to the computer. She's able to, to enter them. And he gets the codes and the uh, information on a big ass floppy disk. Like it's a proper floppy, floppy disk. She puts <laughs> yeah. the stuff on like it's. It ain't no three and three inch floppy. It's like a big ass floppy disk. Like this is like yeah, the original primitive computers we're talking about, folks. Yeah, like this disk is like the size of her head that she puts into <laughs> her handbag. Like it's it's massive. And I, I love seeing that. Um, I don't know what model of computers is because there's so, there's so many. There's like a hundred different eighties <laughs> business and home microcomputers. But I love seeing like the colorful function keys and stuff. We also think it's cool that when you turn on these computers that they're static when you turn them on first it's like yeah. <laughs> awesome 80s Good but yeah just up. as um <laughs> about to, to, 
she's about to escape with her giant bag full of disc or, uh, and uh, she turns around though and she's confronted by Michael Knight who snuck into the room and he's got a gun on her and he's like this is it Tanya the jig is up and she's like come on we can make a deal you know I can um, I can cut you in on the business and he's like oh just like you know we were going to make a deal with me on a starry night back in Nevada and then she realizes this Michael Knight was actually Michael Long. And then she tries to say that um, it wasn't her idea to shoot him. She had to shoot him. She was under orders. And he's like, no, you weren't under orders. Like, you're clearly the boss of this, you know, this organization. And I'm going to I'm going to see that you're brought to justice. But just as he's about to apprehend her, security guard busts in the door. There was a gunfight. She manages to escape with the plans. And Michael gets shot on the shoulder. So he's been wounded. So Tanya, she's on her way out. So she's escaping. And uh, yeah, Michael, he's pretty fucking banged up from, from being shot by that security guard. So he's going to have to make his way back to the car and uh, and get in pursuit and track down Tanya and her accomplices before they can escape and, and fly out of there. Sorry, I was just I was listening to it, but I was also distracted checking when bad blood's gonna start tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, is it tomorrow for me too? I'm not even sure. Uh it's in the next let's it's seven PM. It's, it's within the next twenty four hours, but it de depending on where you are in the world, it will de like our network thing might I don't know if it's showing it live or after the fact. Whereas your one you should get it live. It's wrestling talk for anyone who's listening to this going, what the fuck's that got to do with not writing? <laughs> There's a bad blood. He got shot, all right? That's that's the connection. There's a bad blood coming out. <laughs> so, Michael, he makes his way uh, down the stairs and out of the building in, in pursuit of Tanya, and he's confronted by a security guard who um, is almost fooled into thinking that Michael is also a security guard because he's in disguise, but he... Just as he's about to let him go past, he gets a radio saying that, you know, one of the security guards' outfits has been taken and to watch out for suspicious activity. So he twigs that Michael is actually Michael and he tries to arrest him. But just as he goes to do that, Kit activates and kind of drives towards him, which causes the, the security guard to drop his gun and Michael's able to get the jump on him and escape. So now the... The chase is on. It's Michael and, and, and Kish, and they're on their way to the airport to, to try and, and stop these bodies from escaping. The only problem is Michael, he's beginning to bleed out. And, you know, Kish is kind of giving him his vitals and telling him, you know, you, you'd want to kind of get this uh, sorted out quick or otherwise you're going to have to abandon the mission because you're going to bleed out. But Michael, he's having none of us and he insists on, on carrying on with the pursuit and... There's real panic among the bodies. They they try and get all the Comtron thugs who are driving trucks to to cut Michael off from every direction. But each time one of them tries to block the roads, he just drives right through them. And they keep radioing for more drivers to try and stop him. But the drivers start radioing back saying, like, you know, I'm not risking my life, like, going up against this, like, yeah. indestructible car, like, just for you guys to, like, do whatever you are trying to do, oh, you yeah. know? I'm going to take um, off with then, Chris, Christopherson convoy and get out of there to go do something else. He starts offering like $25,000 to any Comtron worker who can stop him. Like, if you are one of these guys who are working for the company, <laughs> would you watch me? Like, what is this guy? Like, what is going on here? Like, I'm being paid money to run a guy off the road with my truck. <laughs> it's like trucks are normally made for deliveries more than like murder, murdering people. That's, that's the, yeah. the main purpose is deliveries. But one by one, um, Michael's able to dodge or cut through all the trucks. And of course, we mentioned earlier about the empty boxes. Like, we do get to see the classic car goes through back trailer and it's just filled with cardboard boxes that, that scatter <laughs> everywhere. So, um, Michael, he's just catching up with them as they're getting to the airport and they're all, um, you know, going to, uh, 
the board of jazz. Of course, this whole time in now our sixth or seventh instance of great phone acting, um, Devin, he's on the airphone to Michael in the car and he's like, you know, abort the mission, Michael, because Kit says you're just about ready to like die in the car seat there. And like, you know, it's not worth this. But Michael's like, no, I got to keep going. I'm going to get these guys. So the the bodies, they're all, um, they're about to board the jet just when they see, um, you know, Michael driving on to the airfield. And Tanya, she actually wants to stay, stay behind for a moment because she wants to kill him. But uh, her accomplices are like, no, 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 getting bored. We need to get out of here. So they start um, boarding the jet and it begins the the runway journey for taking off. But of course, Michael, he's able to drive ahead of them, turn his car around and start driving towards them. And of course, because his car is virtually indestructible, he's able to use it to cut through one of the wings of the jet which means that everybody has to abandon it just before it explodes right there on the runway. So yes, quality explosion. Bad guys. Um, yeah, it's a great explosion. Great explosion. The bad guys, they're in big trouble. They're not going to be able to get away. The cops are already on their way, but Tanya, she's like, no, we can get away. We'll get away in his car. And she runs towards uh, Michael, who's still sitting in, in the night 2000. He's bleeding out. And she goes to, um, to shoot him through the windscreen and he tries to warn her you know no because obviously the bullet's going to ricochet and it does ricochet and it ricochets right <laughs> into her heart and and Whoops. kills her right there and then it's almost as if she so, yeah. got what she deserved <laughs> oh yeah she 100 percent got well she actually got better than she deserved because she died there and then like you know she ruined this guy's life but she, you yeah. know it was over pretty quickly for her we also assume that the um, the remaining um, Comtron espionage people are arrested, even though we don't actually see exactly what happens to them in the aftermath. But here we see that Maggie sees them um, congratulating Michael. He'd been recovering in the hospital from the gunshot wound, and she started to warm up now a bit more to the idea of them being maybe romantically involved. But of course, Michael now is like, I'm sorry, babe, you know, but... Now I've got a job to do and one man can make a difference. So he does promise her though that he'll be back one day and to yeah. you know, to let her let her know that he he will be back to visit her and Buddy in the future. So we got a nice moment now at the end between Michael and Devin where they discuss the future going forward, where essentially it it's looking like um Michael, he's gonna be the 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 crusader of night industries and they're going to use all their financial power and backing to to pretty much fund uh michael's exploits and his quests to to take down these criminals that operate above the law and bring justice and carry on the 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 crusade of of night senior old man mr knight who we saw earlier on and yeah that's how we how we finish up and on the pilot of Knight Rider with the classic outro as well and music playing, of course. Yeah, it's a good setup. And it's um, like the whole thing of like uh, this above the law and all this business. It's one of those kind of running themes on those shows, too. I mean, like you got uh, other shows like The Fall Guy, which is another Glenn Larson show, similar kind of stories of the week. And there's someone who's like, part of society or but they're, they're kind of a little bit off to the side a bit askew and maybe maybe they're a heroic figure maybe not but they're having to go outside the law or do things slightly off the book but they've got a good moral compass like you know like your best detective police cop shows and all that they'll kind of run on that similar theme and idea where we get an exciting figure to watch each week and but we need some we need some kind of setup something to um bring us back in next time for the ongoing show i don't think it does that well i think um you think we'll ever end up talking about team knight rider the which which what which rider <laughs> team knight rider surely you don't heard know what of team knight rider oh theme. my god oh, team. i thought you said team for a minute i was like <laughs> all right yeah have you heard of that uh it, it's not 
I know they did a modern a remake of it's what a, the guy yeah, had made in the night, right? Is, is it there or is it something yeah, so else? Yeah, so it's a it's a sequel to the original Knight Rider. It's called Team oh, Knight so this Rider. This is a ninety seven no, this is ninety seven, not the other modern other other one that they made more recently. I don't think I've ever seen it's that. I've look I have to actually watch some of that during the week. Yeah, so it's seen um, it. Yeah, science fiction series ran for twenty two episodes and was cancelled. I'll give that a look. Probably so, crap, um, but I'll give it a look. <laughs> just because I've never I'll seen it. I was thinking, a... of it, thinking of the other post 2000 one, but it's not not that. This is like, this is kind of technically vintage. It's 97. So. <laughs> for, uh, for our listeners or watchers, I'll just give a quick read of the start of the blurb. So it was a series that was adapted from the Knight Rider franchise and ran in syndication between 1997 and 1998. And believe it or not, actually features an appearance by Michael Knight in the final episode. Ah. However, is this, Michael is Knight. Is this like when Vin Diesel Michael turns Knight, up for like three seconds in Tokyo Fast and Furious? <laughs> it's not even that good. It's not even um, <laughs> David Hasselhoff. It's actually like a body double and they shoot him from behind. Oh, uh, well, that, that's true to the pilot because that was a different guy. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, someday folks will talk about Team Knight Rider yeah, you know, maybe in the year twenty twenty nine. The twist would be if the guy, um, the actor, not not Michael Knight, but the actor, if he turned up as the villain on that other show, that would be a good twist. Yeah, I actually, um, I think of the pilots we've done so far, and I'll actually I'll include Miami Vice, yeah. even though we did it last yeah. year. I would yeah. probably because it's from say, the same era. This thing. I think Miami Vice, Knight Rider, and MacGyver were probably my three favorites of the yeah. five. Don't get me wrong, I do enjoy um, Magnum and A Team as well, but I think that uh, Knight Rider and Miami Vice are probably my two top favorites of yeah. the pilots. We, we but did. Miami definitely had the bigger budget because it really does play out like a movie. The pilot that that one is like really impressive. But I mean, the whole of Miami Vice is shot more like a movie, even week to week. Like, it had a really good budget. Well, you know, speaking of Miami Vice, we are returning to Miami next week, I believe. We are indeed. We've got pilot season. We just heard from the network, but it has been extended for one more, one more episode. Miami Vice, Castillo, Bushido. Yes, not technically a pilot, but since we no, did the Miami Vice the pilot special, last year, it's a special like spotlight on him. I mean, there's several episodes that build on the character of, of Castillo, who is introduced in, towards the second half of the first season after the original captain gets um, murdered. He comes in, and Edward James, almost just fantastic actor, he can say so much by doing so little, and he's just like he's an amazing actor. He's so good. I love, love him in this. Love him in Battlestar Galactica. You know the remake that did. Or, or anything he's in lots of shows and movies but he's so great as this character and um looking forward very much to talking about this spotlight special where it's it, it's all about him in this episode it's an awesome yeah, awesome i'm episode. gonna be um i'm gonna be re-watching it this week in preparation and i'm i'm really looking forward oh, to it. i have seen it four <laughs> years ago it's been many I years year, but I watched it. Again this week. <laughs> yeah i can't wait i can't wait really looking forward to this and hope you uh hope you folks have been enjoying this look back on these classic shows as well and you know we're doing this um this spotlight on on that episode next week i'm sure we'll at some someday we'll come back and we could do specific a team episodes or specific night yeah. rider episodes yeah. whatever you ever want to do uh always open to, to yeah we can pick, pick, pick other interesting favorite ones or you know memorable episodes i just thought it's good to start start somewhere so we kind of you know and where things kick off it's like when i look back at superhero or pop characters i like to see where they began before they you know changed and did other things later on yeah i'm all for it the journey oh, yeah. continues well, yeah but yeah we'll, we'll finish up there um so we've got castillo next week following that we're going to be kicking off a horror john carpenter month for october i wish We'll see you there. Take care, everybody. Yes, bring your synthesizers. Okay. <laughs>